Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, this special session on the results of the hyd hybrid energy forecasting and trading competition. So uh, I'm Jethro Brawl from the University of Glasgow and was one of the organizers of this competition. And I have the great pleasure of uh, introducing you. So if you come expecting to hear me talk for 80 minutes, uh, please don't be disappointed. Uh, in fact, maybe you'll be relieved. Um, we have four of the prize winning teams here, each presenting their winning solutions, as well as uh, Dennis from Orsted, who's going to present a bit of analysis of the competition overall as well. Uh, so this is the, the agenda. I'll give an overview, then we'll hear from Dennis, and then uh, the four prize winning teams. Uh, but before that, I need to thank a lot of people. Uh, so this uh, competition was organized by uh, the IEEE Working Group on Energy Forecasting and Analytics from the Power and Energy Society. Uh, so I have the help of lots of people you can see named here. I'd like to just highlight uh, a few. So uh, Henrik from uh, Rebase Energy, who are one of the competition sponsors, uh, built the competition platform, which you'll hear about shortly. Uh, so a huge thanks to him. And then a number of advisors um, who aren't uh, formally on the organizing committee also were super helpful. Uh, so, so thanks to them as well. Okay, so why, before we get into the competition itself, why did we want to do this? Uh, so forecasting, uh, as I'm sure no one here needs convincing, is uh, a key capability and a key capability especially for net zero energy systems. So as we transition to using more and more renewable energy, that's weather dependent energy, where we're shifting the way energy is consumed from planning our generation to meet the, the demand we, we prefer uh, to a world where we need to plan our demand to meet the energy that's generated from the weather. And of course, the weather changes a lot. Uh, it's highly variable and it's predictable to some extent, um, but as you'll see today, it's not possible to predict perfectly. So we have to handle that uncertainty. And uh, trading is the other element of this competition. So it wasn't just forecasting. The participants had to use their forecasts to make a trading decision. And this uh, is the primary mechanism by which market participants are incentivized to balance supply and demand. Actually, the, the system operators, the likes of National Grid and so on you might be familiar with, only do the fine tuning at the very end. Uh, the market itself uh, plans the balance of supply and demand uh, in advance. And there's been a long series of energy forecasting competitions which were partially motivated by this crisis we have in academic publishing around uh, reproducibility and generalizability of, um, uh, of methodology. So these forecasting competitions provide a really nice platform uh, to genuinely evaluate forecast performance. And uh, I'm grateful that all the teams here have been very open about the way they solved the problem as well. Uh, you'll see some familiar results from those, if you're familiar with those past forecasting competitions. So uh, this, uh, the results here will help reestablish what the best in class methods are perhaps for some of the, the challenges uh, we see here. Uh, but especially some of the, the newer elements are exploring this relationship between uh, forecasting and decision making uh, and the way uh, we use forecasts to make decisions. Uh, you'll see quite a few different approaches there where um, we haven't converged on uh, a single best approach, which is, is quite interesting as well. So here is the competition setup. As I say, uh, the, the name kind of gives you a hint. So it's the hybrid renewable energy forecasting and trading competition. So our participants we're dealing with a hybrid portfolio that consisted of one very large wind farm and a whole bunch of small-scale solar. Uh, so the wind farm was Hornsey One Wind Farm in Great Britain. It's just off the east coast of England. You can see it on the map here. So it's a 1.2 gigawatt wind farm, 174 turbines, and it spans a huge area. Uh, so this is particularly interesting. Uh, as we gave our participants access to weather forecasts which come on a regular grid. So it's not a case of having a, a single idea of what the weather is at one location. As you can imagine, over 400 square kilometers, um, the picture might be a bit more complicated than that. So it'd be interesting to hear how our participants help, uh, handled that. And also uh, an unexpected aspect of the competition uh, is related to cables. So within this uh, wind farm, there are 900 kilometers of cable that uh, transmit the electricity back to the grid. And actually, at the very beginning of this competition, uh, one of those cables overheated and uh, imposed a constraint on how much power this wind farm could export. So uh, the nature of uh, doing forecasting in practice means we have to handle these things. And hopefully, the teams will talk about how they handled that, that, unexpected, that unexpected event also. 
Uh, the solar portfolio was uh, all of the solar in the eastern England region, which is roughly included in this circle here. So you can see it's quite close to Hornsey One Wind Farm. Uh, it was 2.6 gigawatts installed capacity, but that's distributed around over 100,000 installations, varying from rooftop solar on people's houses to multiple megawatt um, solar farms uh, that span, you know, cover entire fields, uh, for example. So what did this data look like? Well, on the top, we have the output from the wind farm. And you can see very clearly, I think I have a pointer uh, here, uh, when the cable overheated and all of a sudden the capacity was constrained. And uh, there's a, a mechanism by which um, market participants report this kind of event to the whole electricity market and to our, our participants. And they uh, issue a message called a, a remit message, which is about uh, market transparency. And this message helpfully said, uh, problem with the cable, the capacity will vary between 150 and 280 megawatts. Okay. So that's what the teams had to go on. And you can see also as the, the cable was maybe partially repaired, the capacity changed again uh, here and then uh, maybe reduced again towards the end. So the participants thought they were getting involved in a wind power forecasting competition, actually involved uh, yeah, cable, cable faults as well. A few other things to highlight. Uh, wind farms have this property that when the wind speed uh, becomes too high, so around above 25 meters per second, the wind farm will shut down due to, uh, to protect itself from mechanical damage. So some of these instances here where the power goes to zero in the middle of otherwise high production, uh, that, that's one effect that's happening there. Also, the commercial arrangements of this wind farm mean that it's exposed to negative prices in the wholesale market. So if the price goes negative for an extended period of time, uh, the operator might choose to shut down the wind farm rather than paying to produce effectively if the price is negative. And there was also one instance of that during this period as well. So even uh, wind power forecasting maybe involves price forecasting too. And then at the bottom we see the solar, which is much, uh, a much simpler picture. Um, you can see the increasing trend as we move from uh, the winter into spring. And uh, each spike here is the, the, the daily pattern of solar production, which is zero at night when it's dark, and then it peaks in the middle of the day and goes down again. But you can see a huge variation in maybe a cloudy day versus a clear sky day uh, throughout the year. Uh, the capacity is also uncertain in this case, and uh, an estimate of the capacity was provided by uh, Solar Sheffield to um, produce this data. And the capacity also actually increased over the course of the competition, so solar power, solar installations were being constructed uh, over this time as well. So the, forecast, uh, the competition had uh, two main tracks, a forecasting track where participants had to submit a forecast for the total production from that wind farm and all the solar plants. They were asked to submit quantiles, so probabilistic forecasts uh, from 10, 20, up to 90% uh, probability levels for each hour of the day ahead, uh, sorry, each half hour of the day ahead. And this was scored using the pinball loss. So by day ahead here, I mean a forecast issued in the morning of a given day before 9.20 UTC for each half hour period of the day ahead. So roughly, um, what's that, a kind of 13 to 37 hour ahead forecast or something like that. And the reason is that this is the time that the, the day ahead electricity market clears in Great Britain, which is relevant for the trading track. So in the trading track, the participants had to decide how much of that energy to sell in the day ahead electricity market. And uh, we assumed there would be a price taker in that market, so they would just get, a, get whatever the market price was for the energy they sold but then they're exposed to a, a system called imbalance, whereby if they produce more than they sold, they sell that excess at the imbalance price. If they produce less than they sold, they have to buy the difference back at the imbalance price. And I'll explain that more in the next slide. And the score for this track was uh, the total revenue after imbalance. We also had a, um, a combined track, so uh, a third track which was based on the ranking in the forecasting and trading track to incentivize people to participate in both. I think I've said everything on this slide apart from the fact that the, uh, the competition period was three months. It was real-time forecasting, genuine forecasting of the future. And we did actually have to delay the start because of this unexpected cable fault at Hornsey 1, which was right at the beginning of the, the test period. Uh, because that was new and unexpected and we hadn't informed the participants of where they could access data about that, 
uh, we thought it was the best thing to de delay the start by two weeks. And I think that was, that was welcomed. So a bit more detail on uh, the, tra the, the trading task. Well, I, I explained already the participants are selling energy uh, as a price taker, and then the difference is um, settled at this imbalance price. But that imbalance price isn't fixed. So depending on whether the market as a whole has an excess or, or a deficit of power, uh, that imbalance price can be uh, rewarding or it can be punitive. So um, if the participant is uh, supporting the electricity market, so let's say the market as a whole has a deficit and our participant has a surplus, uh, the imbalance price will be high and they'll actually be selling their excess at a, um, a higher price than they would have got day ahead. Uh, up to some point, if they did that, if you take that to the extreme, uh, then the, the situation flips, and maybe the market overall isn't in excess anymore, uh, isn't in deficit anymore, it's in excess. So here we have a, kind of the, the revenue function for a participant uh, in a period where the, the actual generation was 500 megawatts, but ahead of time, of course, they don't know what, um, what that's going to be. They also don't know what the prices are going to be. And so any one of these um, revenue functions could be realized depending on the, the day ahead electricity price, the imbalance price, and how much um, power was produced by the portfolio. So this is quite a complicated picture. If you want to try and uh, forecast what the revenue function would be, that would be one approach. Uh, but we'll hear some of the teams also had other ideas as well. So a quick word on the, the platform. So um, we had a static platform where we hosted all the documentation, about two years worth of historic data, um, including weather, historic weather forecasts and energy data, and a, getting a quick start guide, basically, which was a Python notebook. And then uh, running the competition live, uh, we had a Slack channel for people to discuss issues. Uh, we had an API for people to retrieve the latest data and also submit their forecasts and bids via API as well. So uh, the majority of participants fully automated their participation in the competition. And um, quick word to say, all this uh, data is still sat on the IEEE data port and is available for you to have a go yourself. So quickly onto the results. Uh, here we have the top 10. Um, I, the only thing to really highlight on this slide is uh, it was relatively close amongst the, uh, the, the top uh, five at least and then uh, from uh, six downwards um, in both the, the pinball, so the forecasting track and the, uh, the revenue track. Uh, the, the ranking isn't the same in both, so it wasn't strictly the case that the people with the best forecasts uh, had the highest revenue. And uh, I think Dennis is going to reflect on that a little as well. And special mention to the two t student teams who made it into the top ten uh, also. It's a huge effort to participate in these competitions uh, so, yeah, kudos especially to the, the students. So we had um, over 170 teams registered and maybe looked at the data. 66 participated, uh, by which I mean they submitted at least once. 24 teams completed the competition, so there's quite a, a bit of attrition here. Quite a few after maybe they didn't perform so well in the first few weeks, uh, maybe dropped out. Um, five student teams completed. And I guess you've probably read this slide now, so I won't finish um, reading it all out in interest of time. But some quick takeaways. So quite a few teams uh, use additional data. So we allowed this in the competition. It was real-time forecasting. Um, so why not allow people to use uh, additional data if they have access to it? Um, lots of teams brought in ensemble uh, weather forecasts. Um, one of the top five teams that you'll hear from later also used uh, in-house weather forecast. Uh, uh, AI weather forecast, um, but actually two of the top five teams didn't use any extra data, so it wasn't necessary, and actually quite a few teams used extra data, including extra weather forecasts, um, but didn't make it into the, the top ten even. So it wasn't a, a huge um, differentiating factor. Uh, many of the top methods for the forecasting track will be familiar, so lots of gradient boosted trees, lots of teams um, combining multiple models, uh, which is um, consistent with past competitions in this area. Um, the things that seemed to make a difference was the way people combine their forecasts for the different portfolios. So from the lots of teams forecast wind and solar separately and combine them. Um, lots of interesting different methods there. And as we also saw in previous competitions, um, feature engineering uh, seems to be making the difference between the teams that uh, use gradient-boosted machines. 
trading strategies was much more diverse. So as I mentioned, um, some teams were forecasting uh, all the prices and the system length and somehow deriving an optimal bid. Uh, others tried to just directly predict what the optimal bid would be. And some were maybe honest somehow and simply traded uh, P50 forecast um, and didn't try to, to hedge at all. So that's the context. I'm going to hand over to Dennis now uh, from Osted, who uh, Osted were the other sponsor of the competition, along with Rebase, uh, who's going to give us a bit of insight into the competition. So to you, Dennis. Thank you. Yes, hello, everyone. So first of all, I want to extend a huge congratulations to all the, all the winners that are present here and will present soon. And of course, also a big thank you to all the participants, uh, because yeah, like Jethro already illustrated, it was definitely not a straightforward task to complete this, uh, this competition. So my name is uh, Dennis van der Meer. I'm a quantitative analyst with Ursa for about a year and a few months now. And I mainly work with the uh, probabilistic forecast of our wind power assets in the UK, Netherlands, and Germany, uh, as well as uh, trading, uh, working on trading strategies. Uh, but yeah, enough about me. Of course, we are here to look at some of the results of the winners. And I first thought it would be interesting to just have a quick look at what uh, Jethro already highlighted, and that's what would happen if you just uh, yeah, bid the forecast, your P50 forecast, compared to what the participants actually bid. So that's here on the uh, x-axis, you see the forecast, and then on the y-axis, you see the market bid by the participants. And I think yeah, what, you, what is interesting here to show is that there's quite a lot of uh, strategic bidding going on. So basically, strategic bidding means that yeah, going beyond anything that your P50 tells you uh, you should bid. So, uh, and I think, for example, from SVK, uh, you could see some, some trend here that in the uh, lower half of the forecast, so in the lower power regimes, let's say, uh, there is definitely some uh, yeah, overbidding, if you will. Uh, and then here, I couldn't help but notice there seems to be some kind of a gap between uh, from the forecast, from the P50 forecast, and the and the market bid. So, yeah, from that you can because we have this uh, equation that Jethro already showed, or he didn't show the equation, but the quadratic function. Uh, you can calculate the, uh, what the revenue would have been if you would just bid the P50, and then also what the strategic bid led to, and then you can calculate sort of the value creation of the strategic bidding, right? So in this case, for example, SVK, they made about 600K GBPs, which is quite nice, of course. Uh, you can hire some people to, uh, to develop that. Uh, and then, yeah, most of, the, most of the teams actually had positive uh, positive value creation, so that's very cool to see. Uh, so then we, because we're of course at a forecasting symposium, so it's also interesting to see what an improvement in the forecast would, uh, so in terms of the pinball loss, would lead to in terms of uh, revenue. And then we can see that, yeah, mostly there is a positive uh, relationship, but even still if you increase the pinball loss, so you're producing worse forecasts, you still see that there can be uh, positive revenue to be had. It's just most likely an opportunity cost thing that if you were more accurate in these areas, you might have made uh, better revenue. And I think that's also clear what you see on the uh, right, uh, right hand side. I see now that the labels are quite small, but in the orange line you see the revenue and then in the blue line you see the pinball. And the, the pinball is just a an improvement because it's negative and that's what you want to achieve. So from the top five teams, uh, so the, um, you see here, going from left to right, you see an improvement in the pinball loss, uh, and then, or uh, yeah, in the uh, for, on the team uh, basis, and then you see the improvement in the revenue or the increase in the revenue that is generally there, but it's definitely not as drastic as the improvement in the forecast, which is also something to, interesting, I think. So looking a bit closer into the uh, revenue. Uh, distribution versus the pinball loss. So what I've done here is I've just binned the pinball loss in uh, equidistant bins, and then checked out what the revenue distribution looks like in each of these in each of these bins. Uh, and yeah, what you can see from the top th uh, three teams, I should say. And I think what's interesting here is that 
uh, what, what you can see is, it's, I mean, a low pinball uh, leads to consistently higher revenues, which is probably what you would expect. Uh, but if you go above a certain limit, as you can see in these for the teams uh, Reint and U UIBud, uh, then you just, uh, yeah, it was for these teams at least impossible to create positive revenues. And then for SVK, they were not in this, they did not have forecasts that were in this bin, so they, they did not have this. Uh, so we couldn't compare if that would also be the case for them. But it's just to show that, yeah, really detrimental forecasts will lead to uh, negative revenues. Uh, and but what I think is also encouraging is that even moderately high pinball losses, uh, pinball loss can result in high uh, higher revenues, and that's what you see uh, see here. It's just it's much more spread out, so there is a risk, especially this one. This seems to be quite symmetrical, uh, slightly below zero. And then a final slide just to show a bit on the uh, when, on average, the participants made uh, the mo the most money. Uh, and that's definitely around uh, midday. And that's, uh, yeah, also, uh, that's in the uh, uh, top uh, figure. And that's also definitely because uh, there is just, in general, more production, right? That's the lowest uh, plot. We're just producing much more because of both wind and solar power. But also because um, you can see here in this figure, you can see the prices. So the blue one is the day head price. The, Orange one is the imbalance price, and then the uh, green one is the spread. And because the spread during midday is relatively small, close to zero, uh, even yeah, uh, moderate forecast errors compared to your P50 would uh, not lead to uh, significant drops in, in revenue. Yes, so that's all from my side. Uh, but, uh, and yeah, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what the, what the teams themselves have to say. And I will give back the word to Jethro to introduce the teams. Yeah, thanks. So uh, before we hear from our first prize winning team, just to remind you the competition data uh, is open. Uh, it's on IEEE Dataport, so you can have a go uh, now if you like. Um, and also the rolling uh, submission and leaderboard that we use for the competition is now continuing on a monthly basis. So if you'd like to have a go at participating and maybe use that as an opportunity to do some kind of live benchmarking, um, some of the teams from the competition, in fact, just left their solution running, so you can, you can see today uh, how they're doing. Uh, we'll be preparing an article to describe the competition in detail, which will be coming. Um, but for now, let's hear from the winners. So, uh, our first speaker will be um, Shuangqing Pu uh, from uh, Shanghai uh, Jiao Tong University. So, Shuangqing uh, received the BE degree in electrical engineering um, from uh, Sichuan University and is currently a PhD student um, at Shanghai. And his uh, research focuses on end-to-end -end forecast and uh, forecasting and optimization in power systems. And so, Shuang uh, over to you. I want to come up, I'll set up the slides. Okay, thank you. I'm honored to be here and uh, have won the third place in the trading track and uh, the first place in the uh, student team. And I will share with my experience and uh, the methodology in the HEFTCon. And uh, there are two main solutions uh, for this problem. Uh, the first is directly forecast the total generation, and uh, the second is uh, decoupled forecast and uh, aggregation. Uh, we think um, the first one will lead to uh, overfitting because the model is an uh, integrated model with a large capacity and uh, it, is not, uh, uh, it is not flexible to adjust wind and the solar separately because uh, we need to adjust wind power to deal with the plant outage and uh, the solar capacity is still growing. So we choose that second uh, method. And uh, the difficulty is that the quantile of uh, different random, random variables does not satisfy the activity. Yeah, we cannot just add the wind and solar quantile's value to get the total generation. We can explain them from the CDF, the cumulative distributive function or the pinpoint loss. 
the pinpoint loss is non linear, so it does not satisfy the linear ad adaptivity. So uh, assume we the wind and solar are independent of each of each other. Uh, uh, we we have used the mutual information to test them. The wind and the solar is independent of each other, so we can predict the probability density function separately, and the PDF of, of total generation can be obtained as follows. So uh, by numerically integrating the PDF of total generation, we can obtain the probability distribution of the uh, total generation, and uh, we can get the quantile forecast uh, from the inverse function. So this is our method. Uh, so we have proposed a decoupled, a decoupled solution that we can use some strong learners or ensemble models such as light GBM to forecast enough quantile re results and we use the inter linear interpolation to recover the CDF of the wind or solar generation and we use the numeric differ differentiation and uh, to get the PDF of each other and uh, uh, then we can com convolve them and uh, integrate to get the CDF of total. So uh, in the in the data processing and uh, in the pre-processing, uh, we have filtered the, the value with uh, the first is uh, the generation power greater than the capacity of the wind or sonar, and we drop the value, uh, we drop the data that the value 10 minus reference time greater than 48 hours. And we also drop the data with the NAN. And uh, for the feature engineering, we have choose the mean, maximum, and the minimum, and the 25 and the 75 quantile values for the very forecast coverage area. And we also choose the T minus one T and the T at one sliding window to the capture a time serial feature. And we also use the uh, square and the cube of the wind speed. And uh, we use a random forest to uh, implete the feature selection. And uh, the result shows that uh, we have only used the wind speed in 100 meter. Uh, it also avoid a lot of uh, overfit. So um, we choose the light GBM for the wind power forecast, and uh, light GBM is the main model of the forecast. And we use the quantile short to make sure that the greater quantile value, the, the greater quantile, the greater value. So, and uh, we have assembled two type of uh, weather source the, organi the organizer provided, that is the DWD and the GFS. And then, we use a quantile regression model to ensemble them and uh, also to deal with the planned outage of the RC1. And we just design a truncate model and uh, the, according to the available capacity to truncate them. And uh, this is a simple test in a test set. We choose the reference time equal to zero o'clock and uh, the value time minus reference time greater than 23 and uh, less than 48, and uh, the the pinpoint loss of mean in all quant uh, in all quantiles is uh, get a decrease about 6.35 percent, and uh, the solar the solar dust set contraction is similar to the wind, and uh, but we add the uh, hours of day features in the feature engineering. It is useful. And uh, also, we do the feature selection through the random forest, and the uh, and the results show that we have used the radiation and the cloud cover of T minus one and the T, and we also use the hour of day features. And we have observed that the the installed capacity and have been increased after the competition begin. So we just relied on on the light GBM output. We 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 have tendency to under underestimate the power. So to deal with this problem, we consider a polynomial modified model. And we 
we try to modify the output of the original model. And uh, due to a limit, uh, limit data we collected in this computation, so uh, because, it, because it, it happens after the computation begins, so we just a little data. So we use lasso quantile regression to modify the forecast result from the model train on historic data. We use L1 regulation to make the beta to be sparser. There then is also a feature selection. So the the fo the sort of forecast model, uh, the framework is as follows, and we we haven't we haven't assembled the G GFS weather data because we have tried try to assemble it in our test uh, in our test set and. Uh, the the impro improvement is not obvious, so we just use uh, DWD data. So here is a simple example to demonstrate the effectiveness of the proposed method. We select data from March to May 2024 and divide the training set and the test set into a ratio of sec to four, and the corrected model on the test set reduced the FIMO loss about 15.6%. And also test, uh, test the proposed decoupled and the aggregation quantile prediction method, and which reduce a uh, little loss, but it is also useful. And we have used a uh, uh, hyperparameter search framework called uh, Optuna for model tuning. The type of parameter that needs to be searched uh, as follow in this figure. So uh, considering we are training a lot of models, so. We just search the Q uh, quantile 15 uh, wind and solar model only. So let's talk about the trading. The trading rules and um, the, the revenue can be uh, can be seen as the three parts: the direct market revenue, balance market, and uh, the penalty of generation deviation. And we define the price difference equal to as the uh, yeah. This this is uh, this square is uh, equal, and uh, we define the first difference is uh, uh, pi a minus pi s s, and we can get that accurate estimation of price difference and the actual generation z. It's crucial to bidding. Uh, it's crucial to the bidding decision. So we can we talk about the optimal bidding decision. So the bidding optimal bidding decision satisfies the. KKT conditions and uh, there are also a uh, lower bound and upper bound uh, inequality constraints. And assume that we can we can obtain the forecast results. Uh, we can obtain the forecast of uh, price difference and the total generation. And the optimal bidding strategy is as follows. And uh, in most times, they equal to the first enter, and the other time it equals to the zero. And uh, and one hundred and eight one one thousand and eight hundred sorry and assuming that uh, the price difference and the total generation forecast allowance so we can get the most of most decision and uh, we talk about the decision loss uh, yes yeah, decision loss can be seen as a gap between the actual revenue and the zero zero vertical optimal revenue so it uh, after the deviation it relates to the MSE, mean square error of the total generation forecast and the MSE of the price difference forecast, and they are a coupled item. So the decision loss measures the forecast to the forecast impasse to the total revenue. So it, it is helpful to design a forecast model. Uh, we just uh, we can just change the loss function from MAEQ. Q15 to the MSE loss, yeah. And, uh, and, the other, and the other process is similar to the forecasting track. And, uh, and uh, so we are trying to e e estimate the prices, and uh, there are uh, two parts. This is the uh, daily head price. It has the period, period city and uh, the fluctuation. They, they have similar flotation because it relates to the solar generation and the load patterns. So our feature is useful. And the balancing price, there are no apartment priority C. And, uh, the, and the flotation seems to random. So because, because it relates to the unbalance in the real-time market caused by the renewable generation and the load. 
uh, but the price difference is also can be forecast because, uh, but, but it has a high SNR. Price difference updates are delayed by four uh, to five days in this computation, and uh, we cannot obtain the historical electricity demand and the wind and the solar forecast uh, in this market. Uh, so, so it is difficult to forecast the price difference, but the mean value of the price difference is still related to the hours of day. So our final, so our final, um, final solution is to use a pro probabilistic modeling of the uncertain price, and uh, we consider uh, hour of day as a covariate, and we construct a stochastic programming problem, and uh, after the deviation, we can know that the the final trading strategy is um, is about is strongly related to the. Total generation forecast, yes, yeah, MSE loss function and the and the rolling average of price difference over the past uh, uh, over the past period of time, and we choose the two months because it contains a uh, long memory, long term memory, and the short term memory. So uh, this this strategy only relies on the past electricity price series, and we need uh, no more features. And we also do an uh, application study and uh, both MSE oriented point forecasting and stochastic programming are helpful in boosting the revenue. We just modify the uh, those function from MAE to MSE. It also yeah okay. It also helpful to uh, boosting the revenue. And uh, what's left? Uh, I, I think the value oriented trading is a is a promising me method. It, uh, we can just from the perspective of time series forecasting, and we not minimize the statistical loss such as MAE or MSE. We minimize the decision loss. Decision loss we consider the coupled item in this in the before slides. So this is a decision oriented forecasting. I think it is promising, and uh, yeah, this is a discussion about the competition. There are some tricks, yeah, such like. Um, uh, quantum shorts and the uh, train test uh, test to try to simulate a practical situation, and uh, this computation is online. So online data management is, is important. We can save the daily forecast and the input data. And uh, data assembled is greater than model ensemble. We have assembled model such as uh, catapost, xgpost, because we think it is, it is not obvious. And uh, the future work, we will focus on the end-to-end -end forecast trading, maybe from point forecast to the end-to-end -end probability forecast and then trending, such as the CVR and the robot, robust optimization. And also, we have not used the neural networks in this competition, but I think neural network application in this forecasting is also useful in the future. Yeah. So, so that's all. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. I think we have time for one, maybe one quick question. Oh, if yeah. anyone in the audience uh, has a question, Dennis is ready with the roving mic. Or maybe if you're shy, you can hold them until the lunch break. Yeah, I have a question. Maybe if ah, okay. there is no question. Uh, oh, yeah. I needed a slide actually, but because ah, I thought there was, uh, it was quite quick, but there was one slide where you had the regression coefficients of the, that seemed to be the weights of the, both the price forecasts and the uh, solar and wind forecasts. And it seemed like the, uh, for, uh, the, weight, the regression weights for the uh, price forecast was way higher than, uh, uh, it's a bit back, I think. Ah, oh, no, it's, it's probably further, sorry about that. Yeah, here, this one. Yeah, this one. Yeah, so um, maybe just because the z minus z square, uh, z hat, that was the wind power, right? If I'm not mistaken. Um, Pardon? So yeah, just in the, in the bottom row, uh, the bottom equation, can you just comment on these uh, regression uh, coefficients? So the 0 0.07 and the 3.57. Yeah. Because they they represent the imp relative importance, right? I guess from yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it is related to the rows rows of revenue. Mm. 
Right, okay. Yeah, so but I was just curious if, because uh, the 3.57, that is the, for the price, right? Yeah, yeah. The pi D, and then the Z and the Z hat, which are uh, the Z and the Z hat. What, uh, what do those represent uh, now again? That was, that was the wind power forecast, right? N not, not the wind power forecast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's the total. Z denotes the total power generation. Uh, Z hat denotes the total power generation forecast, and the pi D uh, denotes the uh, price forecast, price difference forecast. And the, the decision loss uh, relates to uh, MSE of both and uh, couple coupled item. So we so we think we cannot deal with the coupled item yet, but uh, we can deal with the MSE uh, in uh, our forecasting forecasting model from the uh, from the MSE loss to the to the MSE loss. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was just I was uh, struck by the difference in the regression coefficients, uh, but yeah, but thanks for the presentation. Yes, okay, thank you. Thanks so much. So. Mm -mm. So our next speaker is uh, Gergo Bata. Um, it's going to tell us how not to win a forecasting competition. Uh, so Gugo is a, a seasoned data scientist with uh, over 10 years experience participating in forecasting competitions. Uh, currently, uh, he works for Vestas Wind Systems, where he develops innovative power forecasting solutions for energy markets. So over to you. Thank you, Jacho. So yeah, I have a passion for forecasting competitions. I also don't have a lot of luck with forecasting competitions, hence the title, How Not to Win a Forecasting Competition. I currently work for Vestas Wind Systems, so it's my daily job to do power forecasting, but it's also, as I mentioned, it's my passion. So these are all the competitions that I uh, participated in in the past 10 years, let's say, and I have, uh, I've learned a lot during these 10 years and during these competitions. Uh, I'm also like that proverbial meme guy who uh, is a bronze medalist but enjoys and celebrates like he's king of the world. Uh, here I'm, uh, I score second place in forecasting and then fourth place in training, so bronze medalist overall. And one thing that I learned during these competitions is that sprinters don't win marathons. And make no mistake, this was a marathon, so it was 14 uh, weeks of competition seven days a week, no holidays, no weekends. You had to be there, uh, you had to be strong the entire time, one misstep and then you go to the gutters. So uh, let's start with the forecasting track. Uh, I had a clear vision in my mind what I want to achieve here in the forecasting track. I wanted a clean and simple architecture that uh, prefers consistent accuracy over peak accuracy and also I wanted to avoid overfitting at all costs, and uh, I wanted to have flexibility. So one key of this kind of competition is to monitor the leaderboard, monitor the, the other participants, and see if you need to uh, catch up, you need to uh, increase your complexity, you need to uh, deliver higher uh, accuracy solutions, uh, and that's what I did. Spoiler alert, uh, I initially started with a very simple, approach, and that's what I, I, I kept using the entire time, so there was no need to use that flexibility. So just to be clear, today what I will show you, you won't see any black magic, you won't see any uh, Kaggle-like complexity, mind-blowing uh, things, just just uh, some couple dozens of techniques, very well established, a, a decent implementation put together to deliver those robust forecasts that we need. Okay, so here's the architecture that I ended up with. Um, so we have uh, the, the NWP inputs, the weather inputs in, in the left. I also use some data attributes, some clever feature engineering. Side note, I think good features win competitions and deliver good uh, forecasting accuracy. Good features with a, with a fairly simple model yield good forecasts, while bad features with the best model yield bad forecasts. 
um, for the for the target data, the energy data, there was some quality issues, so I ended up with data cleaning for the wind part. And then uh, uh, on top of this, I just put light GBM. I will get back to that later. Uh, light GBM creates separate models for each of the percentiles, quantiles, so you need to make, make sure that your final forecast is consistent. I used sorting for that. Uh, and then, as Jethro mentioned, we had an export limit issue, so I applied a capping on the wind forecast. And then on the bottom, the solar forecast is very, very similar. I used, again, both of the uh, NWPs as input, uh, data attributes, and then here the energy data was normalized by the installed or assumed capacity of the region. Again, light GBM sorting, and then I just summed up the results. Et voila, you have your uh, combined forecast and also your market bid. Okay, so digging in deeper, uh, we have feature engineering for solar. Uh, we had ICON and GFS as inputs. In my professional experience, these are like very, very nice, very good uh, weather forecast solutions. We have better than these, but uh, I ended up using them. I had a slight idea of using ECMWF, which is, in my experience, the best for this region. For um, licensing issues and questions, I, I didn't end up using it. Uh, we only had just three of the weather features, temperature, radiation, and cloud cover. Of course, I used all of these. Uh, for the PES-10 region, we had 20 different grid points you can see in the map. They are dispersed all over the region, not um, like uh, equally dispersed. Some are actually out of the region, and some parts of the region is not covered. <clears throat> I uh, ended up just aggregating all the grid points into one single artificial uh, weather grid point using the mean and standard deviation. Standard deviation here representing something like the uncertainty uh, or the disagreement between these grid points. Uh, it would have been nice to use uh, something called the weather station selection, so basically assessing which of these uh, weather stations or grid points are more relevant than others. Of course, keep in mind that solar comes mostly from big solar plants or rooftop, so are not, they are not uh, evenly distributed. They are more concentrated near the population centers or the major power plants, so not all of these, uh, these grid points have the same relevance. Again, this was planned, never actually implemented. And then for the wind part, Horn Sea Wind Farm, it was much simpler because uh, it's evenly distributed. Um, so this is nice. Instead of 120 features, I ended up uh, much fewer features because of this. But then uh, this only represents the, the forecast at time, so the, the time you want to forecast for. And uh, we have the luxury of using forecasts as inputs as well, so weather forecasts. So we know about the future already. We know about the past forecast. So let's use that. I used rolling windows, of course. Here again, uh, generating the mean and standard deviation. I use the centered version so that we include future and past points as well. Um, and in two time ranges, three hours and five hours. So rolling windows are great to represent like major trends and uh, what is happening uh, in the area, but they are also the worst because they don't care about the ordering of your observations. So I use lagged features because here, uh, in solar and especially in wind, we are normally dealing with ramp up and ramp down events, so it, it makes a lot of sense to include this information, which way are we headed. If the model knows that, it, uh, it is uh, forecasting at a much better accuracy. So basically that was it for the NWPs for solar, and then we have the data attributes that I added. Of course, because of our annual and daily cycles of our planet, we. Uh, <clears throat> we uh, observe these patterns, so I've used the year, the hour of the day, and the day of the year. Um, since hour of the day and day of the year are uh, circular uh, attributes, the, um, the normal everyday representation doesn't really suit the models well, so I used the uh, sine and cosine transformation, and then combined all of this together into a big modeling table of just 41 inputs. So from 120 original weather inputs, we went down to 41, but maybe much more representative in the problem that you want to so solve here. So that is it for the inputs. And then regarding the target data, this was also provided by the organizer and uh, Sheffield Solar. Uh, to my delight, uh, I observed uh, pretty good uh, data quality with the solar data. 
but I also observed that the installed capacity grew uh, in like by 10% during the, uh, the period of the competition. So what I did is I normalized my target by this capacity, not the installed, but the estimated, taking into account the degradation of the panels and basically making my forecast time invariant in this sense. So normalization was done here. I also had big plans for like retraining regularly, so I, I uh, initiated a script that downloaded uh, four revisions of each NWPs um, every day, but in the end, the retraining was never required. Okay, one side note on solar is that I really enjoyed that uh, Sheffield Solar was so quick to update us on the actual generation, like two hours after uh, the actual time point. So I, I, I admit, I just refreshed all the time looking at the actual, seeing how my, uh, how my forecasts were doing, and, and it was a great experience generally. Um, I will have a dedicated slide to uh, the psychology of this competition and how to stay involved, and this was a great factor for me. Then back to wind, pretty similar to solar. Uh, we had a bit more uh, weather features. Of course, wind speed 10 meter and 100 meter being the most prominent. Um, we had wind direction on the same levels. Again, circular attributes, so I used the sine and cosine transformation before aggregating everything to uh, this artificial single uh, grid point. And then on the most important um, attributes, which are wind speed 10 meter, 100 meter, I again generated the rolling window features and the lag features. Um, data attributes, very, very similar, and then combined all together, we end up with 61 input features uh, feeding into our light GBM model. Okay, uh, wind energy data. We have heard about the issues here. Uh, we have seen a uh, huge curtailment starting mid-January that basically uh, lasted un until the end of the competition. Uh, but I also observed other data quality issues pre-2024. Uh, uh, I uh, just manually checked and removed these data points that, are, that were seemed fishy so that the, represent, the data representation that I feed into the model would be the cleanest and the noise would be kept at minimal. Um, pretty much that's it what I did with uh, wind. You might notice that I don't have a specific slide on modeling. Uh, that is because, as I mentioned, I went with a very, very simple approach using light GBMs, I could have picked a different uh, implementation. I definitely wanted to go with GBMs. I think Jethro uh, showed us the, um, the statistics that most of the competitors went with it. Uh, it's, it's a powerful tool. I had high hopes and big plans of uh, creating stacked models, ensemble models, combinations, and so on. But in the end, this was never required. Uh, Jethro also uh, showed us different statistics on the team compositions and team decisions. This is my personal approach. This was a one-man show. None of my usual teammates were available at the time. Uh, I also had other uh, well, happenings in my life. I just had my baby daughter. So yeah, a uh, one-man show it was. And then I didn't use any additional data. I found that uh, ICON and, and uh, GFS were more than suitable for this task. No model ensembles here. Built on my personal laptop and submissions were automated but very, very suddenly used. Uh, I, I manually submitted and here is why. So my suggestions for you, if you wanna uh, partake in such a competition, is uh, to start early and start strong. So normally these competitions have a rule like your five or 10 worst submissions will be discarded. And what happened to me many times is my first five submissions were discarded because my first solution was so weak, I, I wasn't ready. Uh, if you are not ready at the first, the, the beginning, then you will suffer a, a, a big uh, penalty over the competitions. So try to bring your A game from day one. And then the second thing I already mentioned is to aim for uh, consistent accuracy over peak accuracy. Uh, at the uh, bottom uh, plot, what you can see is the rankings I achieved during the competition. Uh, you can see most of the times I was in the top 10. Sometimes I was in the top five. And in the end, I ended up in the second place. That is because other teams were doing 
well on, on some days, but then on other days they were much, much worse, and in the end uh, they end up uh, not to be in the top 10. So consistency is key here. Um, second thing I already mentioned, I value feature engineering and data quality over complex models and try to build a robust forecasting system. So, you know, Murphy's Law, if something can happen, it will happen during 14 weeks of competition. Uh, we have seen duplicated NWP forecasts, uh, mixed NWP forecasts between revisions, uh, delayed NWP forecasts, misleading uh, curtailment information and so on. Uh, and also log everything. So I, I've logged my submissions, saved everything, and it was good because I could, I could run uh, experiments, uh, throw around ideas. I, I mentioned already that, that I logged also the NWP revisions. It was really useful. And then uh, how to win a marathon, how to stay involved for 14 weeks, uh, do everything to avoid fatigue. Uh, for me, it's really worth that I, I, I did a manual submission every day. I had a timer set up. I, I spent 20 minutes in generating the forecast, uh, doing a quick check assessment or a sanity check on the forecast before submitting, and then monitor the leaderboard. So see if there are some teams uh, coming up uh, that you need to uh, be aware of, uh, monitor the top three, monitor the top five, and so on. I don't know if the organizers have like statistics on uh, the leaderboard API, but I think I, I accessed it, downloaded data like 10 times a day. So I, I checked it really, really often. So this is uh, the key takeaway for the forecasting check for me. And then we also had a trading check. Uh, I'm a forecaster, so I, 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 I have to be honest here, I, I, really didn't, I didn't really care about the trading track, track at first, I focused on the forecasting track. And then uh, uh, two months in, I realized I'm already second in forecasting, uh, 11th in trading, I won't be able to move up in the general leaderboard unless I improve my, my trading. So I did a historical assessment on the February and March forecast that I did. Again, a good thing to log those. Um, and found that with the P50 that I went with, again, uh, it, it, it came from the getting started tutorial from the organizers, was just too risky. Uh, I, had to, I had to do some risk aversion and went with P40 instead. You can see April 6th, I started with the, using the P40 instead, and from 11th until the end of the competition, I could improve and, and went down or up to the fourth place. Uh, so the, pretty much that's the story of how I, uh, I performed in this competition. The key takeaway here, I, I don't have much in, in terms of trading. Success, successful trading starts with a good forecast. If my, I think my fourth place proves that uh, uh, if you want to make money in this market, first get a good forecaster, and then maybe add some business logic on top. And that's it from me. Thank you very much. So much, and I think uh, we, we need to move on in the interest of time. So maybe you can grab uh, any questions at, at lunch break. Yeah. Okay. So uh, next up, we have uh, team. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, we have uh, Taran Raj uh, from uh, team RNT. Oh, is this, do I want to say yes to this? Anyone who speaks French? Ah, oh, you can't see, okay, I'll say yes and see what happens. We're good, okay. Mm. Ah, you can't see, so this one's a PDF, hence the confusion. Okay, there we go, good. Uh, so uh, Taran is one of the co-founders of uh, Reint, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, Reint's a, a startup which builds AI weather models for predicting volatility in power markets. So, Taryn, over to you. Yeah. All right. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Taryn. Uh, 
I'm uh, one of the founders of uh, Reint. So uh, we started Reint primarily to build uh, short-term AI weather models. Um, just, just. Okay, yeah. And uh, we came across this competition on a very short notice, and uh, we thought whatever is the best we could do it, uh, with the models that we have, um, we just wanted to put them to test, right, to uh, see how they perform, right? So I'll go a little bit into the details of some of the models that uh, we were building uh, and uh, how we participated in the competition, right? So this is me and my co-founder, Hari. Um, right, okay. Uh, so uh, this is, I guess, broadly the um, uh, architecture of the task that we were uh, working with. So we had uh, one short-term AI weather model, which was uh, producing two variables, which is uh, irradiance and wind speed, which was quite convenient for this competition. So um, that was an uh, intraday model, right? Which means um, the forecasting horizon is uh, short for up to uh, six hours or lead time. Uh, so what we did was uh, we extended this model right uh, to day ahead horizon for up to 48 hours and just took the two variables and uh, fed it to uh, a transformer right I'll speak about why uh, we made the decision and uh, trained it against a quantile loss right uh, so that's it um, just um, two features coming from the weather model and uh, that was all we used so uh, this is how the uh, setup looks a bit more in detail um, so the portion below, uh, it shows uh, the architecture of the AI weather model that we were building, or uh, that we had built, and uh, the one above is the uh, transformer, right, uh, which was taking in uh, these two weather features and uh, producing, a, uh, producing a quantile forecast, right, for power. So I'll go into the uh, implementation details in the next few slides. All right. So uh, as I was saying, uh, this is a model that we had for uh, intraday horizon. Um, so uh, this is a model that was built on top of uh, uh, research published by Google. Uh, they published a paper called as MacNet3, uh, which, uh, which has uh, some very interesting ideas on uh, how to build uh, AI weather models for the shorter term, right? Uh, so the key insight with these kinds of models is that uh, rather than simulating how the weather is going to evolve over large compute, uh, you could take uh, a substantial amount of uh, high resolution, uh, higher quality data, uh, feed it to uh, a set of neural networks that would be able to pro or that would be able to understand how the weather is going to evolve uh, over over the time periods, right? Uh, so uh, some of the changes that we made uh, to this particular paper in our implementation is that we cut down on few data sources. Uh, so we ended up using uh, geostationary satellite data as one, uh, location information, um, elevation, and uh, NWP assimilation state and lead time, right? These were our input features, right, uh, into, uh, into the neural net. Uh, so the neural net in itself is uh, quite straightforward. Uh, it's a uh, unit-based architecture, uh, so which is an encoder-decoder style architecture, right? So the encoder uh, primarily uh, helps you learn uh, what the spatial relations are, uh, and then uh, the decoder will help you kind of increase the resolution, right? And Right, so one more key idea which uh, this particular paper introduces is uh, passing the output of encoder through these MaxFit blocks, right? So MaxFit is uh, a particular kind of vision transformer uh, which has uh, global attention uh, in it. Um, so uh, this, is, this is useful to kind of capture uh, some of the longer term dependencies, right? Uh, rather than uh, what convolution does, convolutions uh, does in the first part of the encoder, uh, which is uh, primarily to understand spatial dependencies in the shorter term. Right. Um, right. So, uh, as I said, uh, we had this model producing uh, only wind speed and uh, irradiance. Uh, we trained it against uh, mean squared error loss uh, using a couple of years of history. And uh, this model is a deterministic model. Um, and uh, it, yeah, this model is a deterministic model. And uh, it was also trained against uh, weather observation data, right, rather than um, reanalysis data, which is more commonly used in this space, right. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this model produces observations or, or forecasts at a five minute resolution, right? Uh, so for the competition, we, what we needed was uh, to predict uh, power generation at uh, uh, 30 minute resolution, right? So uh, yeah, what we did was uh, in order to extend this, the only particular change that we made was uh, change the lead time, right? So when we trained, uh, we uh, did uh, one additional training run uh, and uh, that was pretty much it, right? 
so there are a lot more things that we get that we could have done uh, to uh, build a model that is more suited for day ahead. Uh, but uh, yeah, in the interest of uh, time, we didn't end up doing any of that. Right. So this is also trained on a couple of years of history in the same way, right, as the day ahead model, as uh, sorry, as the intraday model. All right, uh, so this is how, I guess, uh, this model performs against um, uh, the two NWP variables which uh, were provided in the competition, right? So about 10-ish percent improvement, right? So when we started, we felt, okay, so this is a good way to probably test this, right, if this uh, fares well, right, uh, in this competition. And then uh, converting uh, weather to power, uh, and as I said, our uh, hypothesis was uh, using high quality uh, weather features alone uh, can produce a very, very good forecast. So uh, what we did was we tried uh, three approaches. Uh, we fed the weather inputs that we were producing to uh, an uh, MLP, which is a multi-layered perceptron. We also tried uh, a few tree-based methods, both uh, Exibus, Light GBM, and uh, CAD boost models. And then we also fed it to uh, a transformer with uh, some modifications, right? So in our uh, quick testing, we saw that the transformer is perf performing a little bit better, so we ended up going with that. Right, right. and uh, I think one more thing to note. So uh, this, uh, not this, right, in here. So uh, this comparison is based on uh, uh, what the ground truth would be uh, in the reanalysis state, uh, right, which is uh, given by ACMWF uh, under the data set ERA-5. So if we were to get, uh, let's say, the actual ground truth um, of, of these variables, I think uh, this probably might look a little bit better. All right, uh, so and then uh, weather to power. Uh, so uh, the setup here is, again, uh, very straightforward, which is uh, we take the weather input and lead time uh, and uh, feed it through a, a, a transformer, right, uh, which uh, produces a set of output outputs that is passed through a dense layer at the end, uh, and uh, it will produce quantiles, right? So when it's uh, trained against quantile loss. So the only change that we made to the transformer here was uh, using dropout, right, in the attention layers, right? So uh, the, this is the way uh, attention uh, or self-attention uh, gets represented by these uh, QKV matrices, uh, which is uh, query key and value. So um, given that we have a shorter amount of data, right, to train it against, so we thought, uh, dropout would be a good way to uh, regularize uh, uh, the, the model uh, and reduce overfitting. So we'd used uh, what we called as elemental dropout, which is randomly dropping some elements of this matrix, right, when we're doing a matrix multiplication there, right? And uh, yeah, so this is the uh, final setup, right, for forecasting, which is uh, we extend the intraday air weather model uh, for day ahead horizon, uh, feed it to a transformer uh, uh, that would convert this input into uh, normalized power quantiles, right? Uh, so normalized essentially with uh, the installed capacity, right? Uh, then sort the quantiles and uh, deal with uh, what the capacity at the time of uh, submitting forecast is uh, based on uh, information uh, in, in remit as post-processing. I think this caused a lot of problems for uh, everyone participating in the competition. And uh, this was our final score. So we came uh, third in the forecasting track with this, which we were quite pleased with. Uh, and then uh, for trading, um, so again, uh, in the interest of time, we took a, a very hacky approach here, which is there were two forecasts that we were producing, which is uh, solar and wind forecast, right? Uh, so we just uh, directly extrapolated that to national level, right? So that would give us some indication on what the um, uh, system level, let's say, supply is going to be, right? Um, and then. Uh, we had uh, this forecast produced by National Grid uh, uh, for demand. Uh, so what we did was uh, we just uh, made an improvement to it. Uh, so I think in UK, most of the uh, solar generation is embedded, right? So you could, you'd be able to uh, improve the demand forecast published by the grid quite easily if you're able to produce a better solar forecast, right? So uh, that's what we did. And then uh, used both of these as features uh, to predict uh, day head price uh, and imbalance price. So the imbalance price prediction is quite iffy. Uh, usually it doesn't tend to work as well, uh, especially if you try to predict imbalance price uh, on a, a day head window, right? So use both of these to compute an optimal print. We gave 50-50, uh, right, uh, uh, in terms of weight uh, to uh, Q50 submission and uh, uh, what the optimal bid uh, hypothetically were to be, right? 
and uh, yeah, we came uh, second in the trading competition, which actually was quite surprising given the amount of effort that we have put in this. Um, and yeah, uh, so uh, I, I think uh, in terms of next steps, uh, we'll publish a uh, detailed technical report, right? Um, so uh, which kind of shows uh, that there are alternative ways to uh, build, build models in this space. And then uh, some things uh, that we probably can do uh, in the future uh, to produce some more improvements is the A weather models that we build, uh, they can be trained on more history and at higher resolution, uh, which are particularly useful for uh, day ahead horizons, right? Which is uh, the bigger context you give, the more the model would be able to understand, right, on uh, how the weather would evolve. And this is by far uh, the biggest, uh, let's say, lever for uh, improving power forecasts, right? We uh, predict uh, weather accurately and that would translate to uh, more accurate forecasts. And then uh, one more thing uh, that we probably could have done is uh, uh, using uh, NWP's future state, right, which is uh, the data provided within the competition from a few NWP providers. Uh, again, in the interest of time, we uh, didn't end up using it, but uh, using them probably would uh, improve the forecast a little bit more. Right. And I uh, had a couple of graphs here. So I think during the uh, competition period and sometime post it, we were able to try in a, a first iteration, right, uh, which was performing a little bit better um, for uh, uh, predicting both of the weather variables. Right. And then uh, one more thing I think as uh, uh, some of the other teams also, have, also has attributed to is uh, using more uh, weather variables and weather-based features. Um, so that is something, uh, again, very straightforward to do, right, would probably help uh, the model performance. And then for trading task, uh, with the approach that we had taken, a uh, couple of improvements primarily can be done in terms of predicting, uh, I think, uh, solar and wind generation as well as demand at national level, right, rather than uh, doing the simple extrapolation. Uh, that would also bring, uh, yeah, more improvements. I think, yeah, that is all I have. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Taryn. So that brings us to our uh, final uh, presentation for uh, the session. Apologies, we're probably going to run a few minutes into the lunch break, but hopefully your stomachs can, can handle it. So uh, our final presenter is uh, Jakob Hus. Um, whose uh, uh, presentation title is Stack of Cats. So I'll find out what that's all about. So uh, Jakob's team, SVK, consists of three members of the data analytics department from uh, the Swedish TSO, SVK. Uh, the main strengths of their team is their diverse backgrounds in wind power research, uh, the wind industry, and computer science. So over to you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So we are from team SVK. And this is our team. Uh, the other guys know a lot about wind stuff, and I know something about computer science. So our motivations for participating here was to learn about probabilistic forecasting. Uh, we have previously done forecasts that did not contain the pinball loss. So we wanted to try this, and we wanted to benchmark uh, ourselves against the competitors and uh, learn some learn some things from, from them as well. Uh, our goals was to have a high availability and uh, while keeping low errors. And we mainly focused on the forecasting track because that's what we do in our day job. And we wanted to like develop these forecasts rather quickly. So this uh, solution was developed during like two weeks. Yep, so st stack of cats, our solution. It looks like this. We have uh, several weather data sets that go into a cat boost model, and we take the outputs from that and into a quantile regression stack, one for, for each quantile. And we basically add the solar power models together with the wind power models, and that is our hybrid forecast. And the output from the hybrid forecast is our uh, is features in our uh, trading model, which is also cat boost based. So, in addition to the provided weather data sets, we also used MEPS, which is provided by the Norwegian Meteorological Institute, and we were quite lucky with the like boundary area here for the competition. 
Uh, and this was like a key factor, we think, in uh, our, our solution being quite good. So, yes, uh, for the data input in the cat boost models, so we just took all, feature, all the weather data features and just put them into the cat boost model. And we did some feature engineering, uh, some lags on the wind speed and the difference between uh, the weather features and some, uh, some feature engineering on the wind direction and some daytime features, and their target was just wind power. Um, yes, so for the solar power, we used, in addition to the weather features, we used the Horn Sea features as well, uh, which gave us like air pressure and stuff like that. Um, and I think the biggest thing we did in the solar, uh, solar models was we uh, tried to predict the cumulative, uh, uh, we, we divided the, the target variable with the cumulative maximum solar power per hour, which gave us like this more flat curve. Um, because our experience is that like the installed capacity time series that is usually provided are not that accurate. And uh, also this uh, any in new installed capacity during the competition would be automatically like, accounted for. Yes, so for the models, uh, one for each uh, weather data set, we dropped nuns. And CatBoost has this feature where you can predict all the quantile at once, and I think that like improves training speed and they, it tries to avoid quantile crossing. Uh, and the output from the CatBoost model, we reversed the division by the, uh, for the solar model. We reversed the division of the cumulative power. Um, and the first thing here in, in the stack is that if any of the base models, the cat boost models, didn't predict, since we dropped the rows with none values, we just filled in the values from some of the other models. And uh, this gave us a really robust model because uh, some, uh, some of the weather data is always there and we got like a 100% prediction rate for that. So I think that was important to stay robust. Uh, well, we used all quantiles into the quantile regressor. We sort the quantiles, and then we just cap the output for a thousand for the solar, and we try to follow the remit messages as best we could. Um, yeah. So this is the result from using uh, different weather models. So. The red versus the pink is like the thing to notice here that adding the MAPS data set gave us an 8% improvement uh, compared to just using the provided weather data set. So we think that was a key factor here. Um, for the trading strategy, uh, we didn't like, we don't have any background in trading and we didn't spend a lot of time on this. So. Our approach was just to calculate the historically optimal bid and uh, try to predict that with like the same models. So we used the hybrid forecast as features and uh, some of the provided time series as well and some daytime features. Uh, the model was CatBoost with MIE loss and uh, we dropped some outliers and we blended this prediction with the Q50 uh, hybrid forecast. And some results here. So this is the trading results. We think that it was like 1% better than just using the 50 quant uh, quantile for the test year 2023. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a comparison to the other competitors uh, and we think that we was like 0.6% better than the trend line on the top performers. And yes, some uh, ideas about robustness. We like retried every HTTP call in case some of the services didn't work. 
using multiple weather data sets uh, was quite important because that increased the robustness in the way we stack the models. Uh, I don't think we ever had to, but in case our main model failed, we had like several backup models that could retry and send predictions. We implemented some email notifications on the Remit messages, uh, so we know how to, when to update them. And uh, in the beginning of May, we like input the wrong values in our limit of the Remit messages, and we had, had a, like a high spike in the errors there, so maybe we should have automated it, but it was so hard to like uh, read these remit messages and and like uh, interpret them automatically. So uh, maybe we should have done that. Yeah, and that's it. <laughs> Uh, thanks so much, Jakob, and uh, all of our participants. So we, we've just run over the one o'clock, so maybe uh, we can ask questions of the, the winners at, at lunch. But uh, before we all go, can we just thank and congratulate all of the, the teams who have presented on their uh, huge efforts and fantastic performance. Thanks so much for sharing, and, and well done. And uh, yeah, that, that concludes the session, so thanks for coming. <laughs>